What is up, YouTube? I'm Devon DaVinci, leader of the Renaissance Crew, and you're watching DaVinci Reacts. Now, today I'm going to be getting into another oversimplified video. Uh, this has been a video that has been requested quite a bit. Um, just a quick FYI for anybody out there wondering. Yes, I did know exactly when this uh, dropped. I am subscribed to Oversimplified. I didn't do a reaction early on. It's because, and I've said this before in the past, I don't like doing reactions to content creator stuff the second it comes out. I want to give them time to build up a, a little bit of views, usually about a week or so, and then I'll do the reaction. So anybody that was wondering like, hey, when are you going to do that? Usually that's the case. So if something else in the future comes out, wait about a week and then see if it drops because I'm not going to react to it the second it comes out. And anyway, to get into this, let's go ahead and jump in. This is the Civil War Part 1. There already is a Part 2, which came out very quickly. I did not expect it to come out as quick as it did. Um, the Civil War, of course, is one of the big wars in American history that I knew he was going to tackle at some point. I'm imagining he's going to probably take care of the uh, the Vietnam War at some point and maybe even like the Korean War. But technically, those are proxy wars that were part of the Cold War, which is a video he did do and I did react to. Um but they're, they have they have enough like details in them that it will make an interesting video or maybe even a set of videos but let's jump into this see what it has to offer and well you guys already know what team I'm rooting for <laughs> uh, I tell the truth anybody rooting for the other team I, I would I would look at them sideways I'd probably I'd, I'd probably have to you know judge them a bit but either way let's get into this this video was made possible by NordVPN. Click the link down below Nord to get seventy percent off an VPN annual myself. subscription, I love it. plus an additional month free. I also, you guys to try. stun your friends, turn heads, get compliments. Buy yourself some oversimplified merch today, along with a very Dude. honest new character. I'm cool. Link in the description down below. Okay, Mrs. Lincoln, this is it. One last push, and we're done. Hang. <sighs> Nine months and four days ago. <laughs> My father brought forth upon my mother himself and gave to her a child conceived in a shack in Kentucky and dedicated to the proposition that I will drink num nums from a bottle and do little poo poos in my pants for the next two to three years. <laughs> now, what is it babies do again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am not touching that. That's messed up. Little Abraham a, Lincoln grew up with his relatively poor family in Cuba. Kentucky, eventually moving to Indiana, and finally, Illinois. He read a lot of books, worked a lot of jobs, wrote some questionable poetry, and finally... Oh, I'm gonna go back to that poetry, I wanna see. He read a lot of books, worked a lot of jobs, wrote some questionable poetry. And he was a wrestler. Abraham Lincoln was a wrestler. And as a big professional wrestler fan myself, he gets points for that. Abraham Lincoln is my name. And with my pen, I write the same. I write in both haste and speed and left it here for fools to read. Did we just get Rick rolled in a way by Abraham Lincoln? Did he just troll us? Was Abraham Lincoln the first troll? Look, matter of fact, go in the comment section. If you can think of a, a, a bigger troll throughout history, an actual troll, Leave it in the comment section. I would love to to see a list of troll characters throughout history. And finally, entered the law profession. Despite being self-taught, he turned out to be a pretty clever and astute lawyer. In one case, a guy claimed he witnessed a murder at night, and Lincoln was like, how could you have seen anything in the dark? There was a bright full moon. A what? A bright full moon. Can you say that again, please? There was a bright full moon. A dim half moon? No, a bright full moon. That's funny, because according to this almanac, there was a dim half moon that night, which makes you a liar. Uh, well... Well, I got a bright full moon for y'all right here. <laughs> now that's what I call a rebut ball. <laughs> Lincoln and his cheekbones weren't only interested in law, however. He also dabbled in the world of politics, serving as a legislator in both local and national assemblies. And what a time it was. Not even a hundred years after the founding fathers wrote, all men are created equal, politicians were already asking, yeah, but what does that mean exactly? It means all men. Yeah. But what does that mean exactly? And not just that. States' rights versus the federal government. What are the executive powers of the president? Is cereal a soup? 
the Founding Fathers left some of these questions perhaps a little too open to interpretation. <laughs> and the biggest question I love of that them picture all that guy. was slavery, He's an a... ugly mark on what should have been a revolutionary new nation based on liberty and democracy. Thomas Jefferson had written a condemnation yep. of slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but out of fear of losing Southern state support, it was removed. Hey guys, do you think leaving this a little vague will create any unforeseen problems in the future? Cannonball! And those unforeseen problems were now beginning to rear their ugly heads. As the nation developed, the North and the South developed along two very different lines, and two very different cultural identities emerged. Northern cities began rapidly industrializing, while the Southern climate allowed for large plantations of labor-intensive crops. As a result, one half of the country didn't rely on slaves, while the other half had become economically dependent on them. In 1793, Eli Whitney's cotton gin caused the slave trade in the South to explode, while in the North, a growing abolitionist movement was taking root. Slave trade in the South to back. explode. So the cotton gin was... It's actually interesting, because I was reading somewhere, and they said that um, because of how the process of... Uh, like processing cotton worked at the time slavery was like on a downturn it was it would have been abolished way sooner had the cotton gin not come out that's something that kind of kicked new life into the whole slavery thing and led to a prolonged period where like i said where it would have been abolished a lot sooner because the South would have probably moved on to something else. It's just the cotton gin gave them the opportunity to make way more money than they ever were able to do. So it's like they held on to it. Economically dependent on them. In 1793, Eli Whitney's cotton gin caused the slave trade in the South to explode. While in the North, a growing abolitionist movement was taking root. A general mistrust began to develop between the North and the South. As Northerners felt the South were hell-bent on expanding slavery, and fear spread throughout the South that the North wanted to take their slaves away. In 1819, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states. A perfect balance. A happy medium. A harmonious relationship. Hey guys, nice to meet you. I'm Missouri, and I would like to become the 23rd state. Hey buddy, welcome to the nation. We'll be happy to accept you as a free state. Oh no you don't. You're trying to get one over on us. Missouri's gonna be a slave state. Okay, listen, why don't we just ask Missouri what it wants to be, and we slave state. <laughs> well, then, uh, allow me to introduce to you the newest, freshest state on the scene, Maine. Hey, you can't do that, and you can't have any more slave states above this line. What? The issue of slavery is solved, and it will never come up again. A few years later, it came up again. You see, <laughs> as America expanded westward, each new state or territory that was added threatened to upend the delicate balance between the slave and free states. If one faction managed to outnumber the other, it could gain an easy majority and force its own ideals on the opposing side, leaving a huge portion of the population feeling spiteful and oppressed. For a while, compromises kicked the can down the road and kept the volatile balance in check as new free and slave states were roughly added in pairs. But then one loudmouth state just had to barge in and ruin everything as usual. Yeah! Of the addition of Texas saw the United States enter into a war with Mexico, which they won, gaining a huge amount of land out west and creating even more problems. Hey guys, nice to meet you. I'm California and I would like to become the 31st state. Hey buddy, welcome to the nation. We'll be happy to accept you as a southern slave state. Oh no you don't. You're trying to get one over on us. California's gonna be a free state. Okay, listen. Why don't we just ask California what it wants to be and we can free state. Well, then, uh, allow me to introduce to you the territories of New Mexico and Utah, able to freely vote for slavery themselves. Hey, you can't do that. And we can enter northern territory anytime we want to recapture escaped slaves. What? The issue of slavery is solved and it will never come up again. <laughs> a few years later, it came up again. In 1854, a Democratic senator from Illinois wanted to build a really cool choo-choo train here and proposed that the territories of Kansas and Nebraska be created open to slavery, even though they were clearly above the Missouri Compromise Line. Obviously, the northern states were like, hell no. But the southern Democrats who controlled Congress at the time were like, well, if you love liberty and democracy so much, then you should let them vote on whether slavery should be legal or not. And so it was. Huge numbers of pro and anti-slavery settlers rushed to Kansas to sway the vote in their favor. And while they were all there, they began to beat the crap out of each other. One of those settlers was a man named John Brown, a former businessman who- John Brown was a badass. Look more into John Brown. This dude, he, he, he turned into what looked like Karl, Mar 
Karl Marx mixed with Frederick Douglass and the dude it was it, it, John Wallace vibes the guy had balls of steel you remember how in the other video with World War II he talked about how the British had balls of steel John Brown is of that ilk the dude was just fucking badass began to beat the crap out of each other. One of those settlers was a man named John Brown, a former businessman who failed at just about everything he tried and went arguably insane. He was a radical abolitionist and dedicated much of his life to the Underground Railroad and freeing slaves. One night, in revenge for an earlier raid by pro-slavery forces, he and his sons killed a number of pro-slavery settlers in the territory, helping to kickstart years of violence known as Bleeding Kansas. Kansas and Nebraska both eventually voted in favor of outlawing slavery, but from here, the tension began to grow at a rapid pace. In 1852, author Harriet Beecher Stowe penned Uncle Tom's Cabin, a best-selling novel that exposed the terrible cruelty of slavery to the world. Oh, how awful. How morally corrupt a nation must be to allow such things to happen. Your Majesty, what should we do about all the starving children working in the coal mines? With the tea. Nothing! In 1854, the Republican Party was formed, and Abraham Lincoln emerged as a leading figure. Southern Democrats viewed the new Republican Party with mistrust, believing it to be radical and abolitionist. In 1856, a politician named Charles Sumner gave a speech in Congress, calling out slave-owning Democrats with fiery language. If slavery was a woman, she'd be an ugly one, and the senator from South Carolina would like to boink her. Representative Brooks, <laughs> do you have a rebuttal? Oh, I have a rebuttal, all right. Yeah, here's a rebuttal for you. Oh, come on. Surely this isn't allowed. Hmm, I don't know. I'll have to consult the rule book. Hmm, I can't find anything about caning a political opponent, but it says here I'm not allowed to wear women's underwear. Uh-oh. <laughs> News of the violence on the Senate floor took the nation by storm. Southern slave owners sent Representative Brooks oh, new no. canes to replace his now broken one. And on the floors of Congress, politicians carried weapons in self-defense, which is never a good sign. In 1857, Dude, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott case that all people of African descent, slave or free, could not be citizens and therefore could not sue for their own freedom under yeah, any circumstances, undoing years of progress with the strike of a gavel. Now, within all this bitter debate over slavery, there were many nuances. North versus South, Republican versus Democrat, states versus the federal government. But let's strip all of that away. For four million individuals living in America, this wasn't about political intrigue or party alignment. It was about the basic human right to be free. Men, women, and children were stolen from their homelands and brought to the American continent, where for generations they were considered to be property, forced to live in poverty, and work from sunrise to sunset. Plantation overseers did whatever they felt was necessary to get the most out of their slaves. Punishments were often barbaric. And just to clarify, I want to say something about something I said in the past that I still believe, but I think some people might have understood what I meant. When I said that black people, I can't think of any other race of people that were able to go from slave, like go from a slavery in their non-native land to becoming president in the non-native land. A lot of people pointed out other examples of civilizations where they had slavery, but, you know, were able to come out on top. My point was, I can't think of anybody that's done that in a land they weren't from. Like, we were taken from Africa, brought to America as slaves, not as humans or anything like that, as property. We've always been considered property as long as we've been in America. So to go from that to present of this country that we weren't from and were brought strictly to be property, I can't think of anybody else throughout history that's done that. Now, like I said, there have been people who have pointed examples, but the difference is the examples that, well, so far anybody's pointed out, because I, like I said, I would, I would like to see if somebody can point to something like that uh, similar, but the examples that people pointed out to were people that were turned into slaves in their homelands, like some invading force came in and turned them into slaves. Like they still had history in that land, and after the invaders left, they still had their own place. Like America, this isn't, the native land for black people well except for like citizens like me <laughs> but the, we were brought in we weren't native to this land at all like this is not it would be like if it would be like if britain went to india captured a bunch of native indians brought them to great britain as slaves the indians eventually became free 
and then the Indian became leader of Great Britain at some point. Like that, like, like an example like that. Like I, I had, can't think of anything throughout history that's happened like that. But I would like to see if somebody could point to something because, I mean, it would be fascinating to learn about. Families were regularly separated, and parents could often only watch as their children were auctioned off, never to be seen again. Thousands of slaves took the treacherous risk of running away, and yeah. abolitionists in the North helped many escape via the Underground Railroad as bounty hunters entered the North to chase them down. Yep, and with the Fugitive Slave, slave Law that they pointed out in 1850, like in the past, all you had to do was just run to a free state, and you were good. But because of the Fugitive Slave, slave Law, it made it so that even if you're in the free states, slave catchers could come into the free states, catch you, and bring you back to your plantation. So now you had to run from the south of the United States all the way to Canada. <laughs> so it's like it wasn't a small trek. It was it was it was rough and you had to be hidden the whole time. You if somebody like discovered you, they could bring you back. Leading figures within the abolitionist movement included many significant free Harriet black men Tuttle. and women. But it's important to note that for many of the like anti-slavery white individuals in the North, ever. opposition to slavery was often an economic issue, not a moral one, as many worried large plantations would take their lands and livelihoods away. Abraham Lincoln knew that slavery was a moral evil, and he regularly spoke out against it in powerful speeches that helped him rise through the ranks of the new Republican Party. He lamented at the hypocrisy of a great American nation meant to stand as a shining beacon of freedom while also enslaving four million men, women, exactly. and children. He most famously declared in 1858 that a house divided against itself cannot stand, that one day slavery in America would end. However, even Lincoln was cautious in his opposition. He didn't want to outlaw it entirely, but simply prevent its expansion so that given enough time, he believed it would naturally die out. Thankfully, history would force his hand. In October 1859, one abolitionist decided he'd try to single-handedly take down slavery by force. Who would be crazy enough to even attempt such a thing? Of course, John uh, Brown. It's our good friend, John Brown. He planted seize arms from an armory in the town of Harper's Ferry, free the slaves there, and continue south, inciting a major slave uprising along the way. A noble cause, a bad plan, and terrible execution. Brown's men took the armory and some hostages, but were quickly surrounded by one Robert E. Lee and his U.S. Marines. Brown was captured, and a couple of months later, he was executed for treason. Northerners sympathized with Brown, but Southerners were like, you see this? They're coming for us. Soon, there'll be a million John Browns. A million John Browns? What on earth are you thinking about? A John Brown farm? Yeah, me too. To make matters worse, new northern free states meant now the southern states really were outnumbered, and they were beginning to feel bitterly spiteful and oppressed. Further fear began to spread in the south when news broke that a relatively unknown figure had just secured the Republican Party nomination for He's president. Abraham Lincoln, please. mostly well-liked among anti-slavery northerners, had made some of the most powerfully worded speeches against slavery of any politician at the time. And now, there was a chance that he and his cheekbones could become president. For the south, that would be too much. In the 1860 Stupid election, Lincoln's Abraham. name didn't even appear on the ballot in 10 southern states. But much to their horror, when the final results came in, Lincoln had won by an electoral college landslide. Lincoln himself tried to calm their fear. How many times do I have to tell you I'm not going to take away your slaves? Yeah, right, honest Abe. We've had enough of you northerners. We're going to go form our own country. You can't do that. Why not? Well, if if you had won the election, would it be okay for us to leave? Of course not. Well, why not? Because that's not how victim mentality works. Many states felt that when they joined the Union, they always withheld the right to leave it whenever they pleased. Many people living in 19th century America often felt more loyalty to their state than to the nation. And now, with the South feeling like it had lost its voice in the federal government, they were out of here. Yeah. Um, at the time, America was still rather new and... The Constitution was like just created less than 100 years before that. So people still identify with their states because before the War of Independence and everything else, like the territories were states like you like I would example for consider myself an Ohio when before I would consider myself an American. Like that's how it was. The Civil War was probably the first test and the first thing that really solidified the country. And even then, I think that it like took a while before like something came about that led to being identified as an American first. 
South Carolina was the first to go, and over a period of six months, one by one, 11 slave states officially seceded from the Union, with just four contested border states opting to remain. The seceding states issued a number of official documents justifying their secession. South Carolina proclaimed that it was northern states' hostility to slavery that rendered the federal government illegitimate. Mississippi declared that their position was thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. And in a speech, the Confederate vice president stated that the new Confederate government rested upon what he called the great truth of racial inequality. Rev yeah, now, that is, I'm glad he actually said that because I believe he put that in here because there's this misconception that the Confederacy was started strictly because of states' rights and they didn't like the authority that the federal government had over their uh, states or whatever. And that's not entirely true. The main 100%, well, not 100 the main purpose, the 90% reason why they seceded was slavery. That's it. A lot of people want to try to conflate the meanings behind it and states' rights and this, that, and the other. It was slavery. That It's always been slavery. You look at almost every single article of uh, secession that the Confederate states presented, every one of them mentioned slavery as like one of the main reasons. So I'm glad he threw that in there. The Confederate government rested upon what he called the great truth of racial inequality. Revered American generals, such as Robert E. Lee, opted to side with their states over the Union. And with all the chaos, one New York lawyer wrote that rather than a bold eagle, America's national bird should be a debilitated chicken. And hey, I kind of like that. <laughs> one man, watching the crisis unfold, knew it would be his job to solve it. Lincoln was just about to hop on a train and become the president of the United States of America. Hey man, you're hella ugly. Grow a beard or something to hide that face. Damn. Hmm. Good idea. Hmm? Eh, still ugly. <laughs> With assassination plots already underway, Lincoln had to travel to Washington, D.C. under heavy disguise and protection. All along the way, he received stacks of threatening letters. May the hand of the devil strike you down. You are destroying this country. Damn you, every breath you take, love from... Grandma? At his inauguration <laughs> speech, Lincoln once again reiterated that, no, I do not want to take away anyone's slaves. But for Lincoln, he did want to preserve the Union. He declared secession to be nothing but an illegitimate rebellion. In your hands and not in mine, he said, is the momentous issue of civil war. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. We are not enemies, but friends. It was clear Lincoln was ready and willing to get freaky and open up a can of Scatman John if he had to. Whether he had the support of the people, however, was in question. In the end, it was the Confederates that fired the first shot. As they seceded, and this the day, Confederate still states act like began the seizing federal U.S. property throughout the South. Off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, was one such federal property, Fort Sumter, held by a measly, undersupplied U.S. force. The Confederate militia there demanded the fort surrender, a request which was quickly denied. And any oh, remaining heck. hope for a peaceful solution to the secession crisis probably then died when the Confederates did this. The Battle of Fort Sumter is considered to be the beginning of the American of Civil, the War. Civil War. Many yeah. of the Confederates there also considered it to be the end of the American Civil War. They hoped Old Abe would just sigh and say, okay, you win. Unfortunately for them, Lincoln actually said, you're about to get a roundhouse to the face. Lincoln sent out the call for 75,000 volunteers and <laughs> men take signed the left up side in my foot and put, put it on the right side of your face. Good old fashioned F-U-N. In the new Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia, Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his cheekbones had also sent out the call for 100,000 men. Don't As ever, beer. both sides hoped for a quick end to the war. Is it over yet? No, Jimmy, it's been one week. Is it over now? No. <laughs> How about now? If you ask that one more time, I swear I will turn this army around and you'll all have to go back home to your wives and children. Mm. But in particular, the South knew the conflict would pose a bit of a challenge. How can we expect to win with a population of only 5 million against 22 million in the North? If you count us 4 million slaves, you'd have 9 million. Great idea. Hand these rifles out to all the moon. Wait a minute. <laughs> you almost had me there. The problem for Lincoln was that many of his top generals were getting old and were being a bit too cautious. The commanding general was a man named Winfield Scott, a veteran of the Mexican-American War. And by now, he was too fat to even mount a horse. Oh my God. Okay, chaps, we need to come up with a plan. Hit me. We could wait for the Confederates to come and apologize. Maybe we should all sit in a circle and discuss our feelings. Crossing the Delaware into New Jersey worked for me. Those are all terrible ideas. And you, 
Wrong video. Hey, I'm the greatest president in the history of this nation. Yeah, we'll see about that, dingus. Eventually, Lincoln's generals came up with a multi-pronged strategy. Hey, we'll First, a, a blockade would cut off and starve the south of supplies by sea. Secondly, taking control of the Great Mississippi River would sever the south's economic artery while splitting it in two. And finally, a main Union force in the east would move south and take the Confederate capital, ending the war. Bada boom, bada bing. Skirmishes began to break out across the nation, and the Union army in the east began to move south towards Richmond. Everything seemed to be going well until they reached Manassas, where they came upon a large Confederate force. It's almost like they were waiting for us. How did they know? As it turned out, spies in DC had sent a coded message to the Confederates warning of the invasion. Did you use NordVPN? What the heck is NordVPN? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Do you use the internet? <gasps> Me too. Yeah, I Do use like NordVPN myself. <gasps> I like it. Me too. Hey, we should hang out sometime so I can tell you about NordVPN. NordVPN has over 5,000 like secure to, and super you like fast to use servers free download in 60 sites that allow you to surf the net safely without personal data have like data limits logging. for how much Not data you can use at a time. Not only does it help you stay secure, but with just a click just of a button, servers. you can take a quick trip to Sweden amazing. and enjoy some Nordic crime dramas. Is there some amazing content on YouTube that's still blocked in your country? Not to fear. NordVPN is and here. That's the way to get around gives you access to all of these amazing features. I have videos on my channel that are blocked money back guarantee. So like click the link in the description uh, below. NordVPN.com like slash oversimplified. With NordVPN, and you can just switch over to another country to get 70% off an annual subscription. That's only $3.49 a month plus an additional well, we month for free. States. Again, it's that's NordVPN.com slash oversimplified. And as always, you'll be supporting my channel. So thank you. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah. Secession, Fat <gasps> Man, and the Union invasion into Virginia. The two sides encountered each other at Manassas, and both geared up for the first major battle of the Civil War, the first battle of Bull Run. The Confederates rapidly brought in support by a rail, and the two sides were about equal in numbers. However, they were also equally inexperienced. A large number of civilians also rode out by carriage from DC to picnic on the nearby hills and watch the excitement unfold. Nobody seemed to quite understand how destructive this war was going uh, to be. Yeah. The Union forces pulled a flanking maneuver to hit the Confederates on their left, and the two sides fired on each other in rows. Farm families living in the area were forced to flee the fighting, including a man named Wilmer McLean. Hurry up, Martha! There's a war out here! The more you tell me to hurry up, the slower I will go! <laughs> the Union force saw initial success pushing the Confederates back to Henry Hill, but one as of yet fairly unknown General Thomas Jackson had stone arrived, wall. and he took a defensive position, standing firm like a stone wall, holding the Union army off, and finally sending them running back to Washington, D.C. With heavy casualties, the sobering reality of war hit both sides hard, and the North, having just lost the first major battle, had to face the serious prospect that they may not actually win this war. President Lincoln, General Jackson whipped us so hard, the Confederates are calling him Stonewall Jackson. Wait, that's why they're calling him that? Not because he looks like he ran face first into a stone wall? Ooh. Apparently not. Worse yet, the North had also lost the first major battle out West, giving away control of Southwest Missouri. All of this was terrible news for Abraham Lincoln, especially since many of his generals and cabinet already didn't have much respect for him. They felt he was incapable of running a war because he seemed a bit like your friendly old grandpa. He famously loved a long-winded story and a good pun. I've been so busy, my wife is missing me, but her aim is starting to improve. <laughs> but deep down, few realized he could also be incredibly shrewd. <laughs> oh, Abe, you're so funny. Funny how? <laughs> funny like I'm a clown? Uh, Abe, I was just... No, no, funny how? Like I'm here to amuse you? During the war, Lincoln committed acts that were viewed by some as impeachable. His administration suppressed the free media from printing articles sympathetic towards the South. Yeah, in a way, some Southern were. sympathizers were even arrested without a trial. Lincoln's criticizers began accusing him of being a tyrant. But to quote the man himself, Hey, it's war, baby. What are you gonna do? Yeah, uh, I did watch a video not too long ago that discussed some of the things that uh, um, Abraham Lincoln did that would be considered tyrannical um, it was a video from Mr. Beats if y'all know that YouTube channel um, it was a video in regards to ty like, tyrannical leaders in America and they were talking about like a comparison between Trump and what he's done to some of the things that presidents in the past have done that they don't really you don't really know too much about like some of the things that Abraham Lincoln did uh, holding down free press and imprisoning people without trials and things like that and 
it was making some good comparisons, like things you don't really know about, stuff that history don't really talk about. So if you guys want to check that out, uh, be sure to check out Mr. Beat's channel and you know, look at his videos. By the end of 1861, with things already looking bad for the North, abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass couldn't believe that the Union Army weren't enlisting black men. He continued to put pressure on Lincoln to make the war about emancipation. Mr. President, it's time to make the war about emancipation. Hmm, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. The feathers are already ruffled. But Lincoln, hanging on to hope for a quick end to the conflict, continued to fight only for the preservation of the Union. It was decided, however, that escaped slaves from the Confederacy could be held as enemy contraband, and many of these men were put to work bolstering the Union's infrastructure and supply lines. Hoping to get things moving, Lincoln made young General George McClellan the new commanding general, and McClellan began to train up his men. He thought a lot of himself, however, and believed he was going to be the nation's great savior. And like many others, he didn't approve of the president's handling of the war. On one occasion, Lincoln went to McClellan's house to meet with him, but McClellan was late returning home. He kept the president waiting, and when he finally got there, he just straight up went to bed. Now that's what I call disrespectful. McClellan talked the talk, but could he walk the walk? No. Like Lincoln's other generals, McClellan was maddeningly cautious. Hey man, could you move south and attack the enemy? What? Are you crazy? What if they have a big scary army down there? They probably do. What? Oh my gosh! McClellan worried that he did not have the numbers he needed to fight effectively. What That's if they have enough. like 10,000 men? Okay, no problem. We'll get you 20,000 men. Well, what if they have 30,000 men? I'll need 40. Okay, you can have 40. Well, what if they have 50? I'll need 60. Lincoln tried, but it was all in vain. McClellan would not make a move for the rest of the year. The North's one saving grace for now was a general out west fighting in Kentucky and Tennessee. General Ulysses S. Grant cool, collected, methodical, and a big fan of whiskey. His chief of staff took it upon himself to keep Grant sober. One officer said that Grant habitually wore an expression as though he were determined to drive his head through a brick wall and was about to do it. And that determination led him to score a number of key victories when others around him were failing. At the Battle of Fort Donelson, Grant was like, why does Stonewall Jackson get a cool nickname and I don't? I want a cool nickname. Sir, the Confederates say they're ready to surrender and want to know your terms. No terms, just unconditional surrender. Hey, unconditional surrender Grant. That's a pretty cool nickname, right? Guys, right? Later in April 1862, the Confederates launched a sudden attack on Grant's army at Shiloh, but the determined, unconditional surrender Grant threw his lines at the rebels and sent them running. The battle resulted in the heaviest casualties in US history so far. And despite his victory, Grant found himself under fire. You have to get rid of Grant. Why? Didn't he win? Yes, but he just threw his men at the enemy. Isn't that the point? Also, he's a loony drunk. Well, what does he like to drink? I believe whiskey, sir. Then send him more. <laughs> Lincoln watched as his cabinet did nothing but bicker and his generals did nothing. But then, worst of all, personal tragedy struck. Lincoln's young son. son, Willie, very much loved by the president, died of typhoid fever at the age of 11. Lincoln was a sensitive man and was heavily affected by the loss. His wife was inconsolable. But one of Lincoln's greatest traits, what made him such a great leader, was in the darkest of times, with composure and determination, he kept moving forward. He knew it was his responsibility to hold himself and his family together. And by doing so, he hoped to hold the nation together. That's what makes a great leader. It isn't about what you do in the good times. It's about when bad stuff happens, how do you compose yourself and how do you get your country through it? If you look throughout history, all the greatest leaders are people that did things like that. Determination. He kept moving forward. He knew it was his responsibility to hold himself and his family together. And by doing so, he hoped to hold the nation together. And he had had it with McClellan's in action. Lincoln decided he was going to take control. In March 1862, Lincoln firmly ordered McClellan to once again move south towards Richmond. McClellan insisted instead they move by sea to the Virginia Peninsula and attack Richmond from the southeast. Yes, said Lincoln. Okay, anything. Lincoln held on to some of McClellan's men to defend D.C. from a nearby Stonewall Jackson wreaking havoc in the Shenandoah Valley, and he sent McClellan south. McClellan landed on the peninsula, and he began to move inland. He came up against a small Confederate army that had dug in at Yorktown. McClellan vastly outnumbered the force, but it's said that Confederate General Magruder deceived McClellan by cleverly maneuvering his smaller force and making McClellan believe he faced a huge army. No, you have way more men than them. Move forward. No. 
McClellan settled in for a month-long siege, giving time for Johnston to move south from Manassas and Magruder time to retreat. When he finally entered the city and found it deserted, he declared it a victory, calling his success brilliant. Then, after meeting some resistance at Williamsburg, McClellan moved to within just 20 miles of Richmond, his armies able to hear the church bells ringing in the enemy capital. You still outnumber them. Go give them hell. No. McClellan once again held back, moving slowly and defensively, and with his army split in two, the Confederates saw an opportunity to strike back. McClellan's advance was halted, and now the Confederates pulled an ace out of their sleeve. General Lee, you're up. Do you think we should evacuate Richmond? No, Mr. President, no need. General Robert E. Lee, one of the most brilliant military commanders of the time, was now in charge. One of his biggest strengths was his ability to read the mind of his enemy, and he knew McClellan was cautious and weak. After moving Stonewall Jackson south to join him, and even though he had a smaller army, Lee hit McClellan in a series of fast-paced, close combat battles that had McClellan spooked. McClellan retreated the Union Army back again and again and again, escaping the peninsula and returning to DC. Lee had defeated McClellan, and the campaign had failed. Well, that was a major success. A success? Tell me exactly what was successful about that. Well, we successfully retreated. You lost. <laughs> I didn't yes, lose. Success. I merely failed to win. Things just kept looking worse for the North. At least their Navy had seen some success, capturing a number of key port cities, notably when they steamrolled past Confederate forts to take New Orleans. And speaking of the Navy, both sides had begun using ironclads. So that's pretty cool. But in the East, they still weren't having any luck. I've heard someone say that that was the first time that, uh, wooden ships were like not being used anymore like that was the the turning point in war where that like ships were now from now on going to be made from metal as opposed to wood i don't know how true that is but gun using ironclads so that's pretty cool but in the east they still weren't having any luck after mcclellan's disastrous campaign lincoln briefly sent out one general john pope to attack northern virginia hey man just checking in how's it going well, the Confederates kicked my butt at Cedar Mountain. Then they raided my camp and ran off with my money and clothes. Also, I appear to have been wedgied. Lee defeated Pope at yet another battle at Bull Run, in which nearby farm families once again got caught up in the fighting. Hurry up, Martha! There's another war out here! I'm waiting for my hair to dry! <laughs> Wilmer McLean, sick of war, moved his family south, where he knew the war would definitely, absolutely never touch him again. But Lincoln had yet another Small problem to contend with. European powers, in particular the UK, were looking increasingly like they may intervene diplomatically on the side of the Confederates. They were missing their precious supply of Southern cotton because of the Union blockade, and they wanted to see a swift conclusion to the war. The tension between America and Great Britain had been increasing, especially after Confederate diplomats were discovered on a British ship. Now, after McClellan's failure to take Richmond, the UK declared it impossible for the North to win. Lincoln needed something to prevent Europe from getting involved, and after more petitioning from abolitionists, he decided maybe the time was finally right to make the war about ending the institution he hated, slavery. If the North had a noble cause to fight for, Europe would be less likely to intervene. But Lincoln and his cabinet knew before they could declare something as radical as emancipation, they needed a victory, especially now that the Confederates were about to go on the attack. Aware that he had a limited number of men and supplies, Lee now hoped that if he could just threaten Washington, D.C. militarily, he would gain Europe's recognition and crush Northern morale in time for the midterm elections, forcing the North to negotiate. With confidence at an all-time high, for the first time, Robert E. Lee invaded the North. But on September 13th, the North finally had some luck. Oh boy, it's my lucky day! A cigar in a field. Hey, what's this wrapped around it? Oh my gosh! That's right, the North had discovered General Lee's battle plans wrapped around some cigars. And in them, they saw that Lee had split up his forces. McClellan headed out from DC, and the two sides met in the Battle of Antietam, a crucial battle that would decide the course of the war. It saw the most vicious fighting to date, and still remains the single bloodiest day in American history. But for once, the North came out victorious, and Lee was forced to retreat. He's on the run. Chase him down and finish him off. No. I wish they listed the actual number. You know what, of, old buddy, like, old pal? Toll. You're fired. The North had won their crucial victory. Lincoln breathed a huge sigh of relief, and with that win, he was prepared to take a huge step. On September 22nd, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. In January, all slaves held in the Confederate States would be, as far as the U.S. government was concerned, officially free. Throughout the North, 
free black men and women rejoiced, knowing that if the North were to win, their brothers and sisters would no longer be held in bondage. The proclamation also had the intended effect on Europe, who were not willing to oppose a pledge to end slavery. An outraged Confederacy knew that Lincoln had given the war a new meaning. It was no longer just about the preservation of the Union. Now, it was about creating a new Union, washed clean of its original sin. A Union without slavery. See, that would have worked out well had Reconstruction after the Civil War been able to, if it was incorporated to its fullest capabilities. The problem was with Reconstruction, uh, Abraham Lincoln allowed the South to continue to pretty much govern themselves. And I don't know if it was Abraham Lincoln or Andrew Johnson. It was one of them. But instead of occupying the South and incorporating laws that would turn it more like the northern states, over time they would have changed and become more accepting of black people and things like that. But because they pretty much allowed the South to do what they want, that eventually led to the creation of Jim Crow laws and the, the, the founding of the KKK and domestic terrorists that pretty much and disenfranchised uh, African Americans or black people. I don't know why I said African Americans. Um, disenfranchised black people so that they would be discouraged to vote. They had all types of laws that were put in place that kept black people from voting, like the grandfather clause, which pretty much said that if your if your family member wasn't a citizen of the United States, or if your ancestor up until your grandfather wasn't a citizen of the United States, then you weren't allowed to vote. And obviously with a lot of black people at that time having parents, let alone grandfathers, being slaves, they weren't considered citizens, so it kept them from voting. Then you had literacy laws where you had to take like tests and because a lot of slaves weren't ever taught uh, education and things like that, they weren't able to pass them. Then you had poll taxes where you had to pay a certain uh, a fine, or not a fine, but a certain amount in order to vote. and because of black people's situations, they were usually very, very poor, weren't able to pay the poll tax, so they put a lot of stuff in place to keep black people from voting, and obviously that led to the uh, Jim Crow-loving white folks <laughs> in the South to continue to vote in representatives that held black people and stuff down for a long time. And this continued on all the way until the Civil Rights Movement in, in the 1950s and 60s. So. I would like to see, because I don't think alternate, uh, his, Alternative History Hub ever did a video on this, but I would like to see a video about what America would be like had the Reconstruction been fully enacted. Like what America would be like if we, if they, if the Amer United States government went in and kind of forced the South's hand to doing certain things. But with that being said. This video is very, very interesting. I will be watching part two uh, very soon. It'll come out with my next batch of videos. And I'm glad that he put in a lot of things that were con like misconceptions, like the idea that the South uh, seceded simply because of states' rights. And there's a lot of people for some reason that thinks that there's like this giant secret that the Democrats were the ones that started slavery or the ones that supported slavery and started the KKK and this that and the other that's never been a secret that that's been it, it, it's pretty well established throughout history that that's what happened nobody denies that so I don't know why people throw that out as if it's some type of revelation but whatever with that being said I enjoyed the video um, oversimplified always does great videos when it comes to history and things like that and just a FYI, the channel is called Oversimplified, so it's very likely they will over, like step over some details or even possible that they might get something wrong. I've heard people say that they were wrong about something or another, and while that is usually rare, it does kind of happen. So do what I do with these videos. Take these as inspiration to go out and look more into the historical the historical topic that they're covering 
Don't just watch this and just think that you know everything about what's going on in this period because there are people that will do stuff like that. Go and look more into it. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I'm Devon Da Vinci. Hopefully you've just been a little more enlightened. I look forward to seeing you guys in a future video. And until then, I'm going to give you the deuces, and I'm signing out. Deuces. <laughs>